Welcome to the Science of Success, the number one evidence-based growth podcast on the internet, bringing the world's top experts right to you. Introducing your hosts, Matt Bodner and Austin Fable. Welcome to the Science of Success, the number one evidence-based growth podcast on the internet with more than 5 million downloads and listeners in over 100 countries. In this episode, we bring on one of the fathers of decision-making psychology, Robin Hogarth, to discuss several fascinating takeaways about how to make better decisions. I'm not going to lie to you. Robin is an OG of decision-making science. Like, seriously, he's kind of an old guy. He doesn't have a professional recording setup. He doesn't have a podcast studio in his house. And so the audio quality may not be the top-tier standard, but the content was so good that I really felt like you should listen to this episode. Are you a fan of the show, and have you been enjoying the content that we put together for you? If you have, I would love it if you signed up for our email list. We have some amazing content on there along with a really great free course that we put a ton of time into called How to Create Time for What Matters Most in Your Life. If that sounds exciting and interesting and you want a bunch of other free goodies and giveaways along with that, just go to successpodcast.com. You can sign up right on the homepage. That's successpodcast.com. Or if you're on your phone right now, All you have to do is text the word SMARTER, that's S-M-A-R-T-E-R, to the number 44222. In our previous episode, we brought on private equity expert Perry Anderson and shared some incredible insights around the inside baseball of buying companies with no capital. Now for our interview with Robin. Robin Miles Hogarth is a British-American psychologist, author, and emeritus professor in the Department of Economics and Business at the... I'm going to mispronounce this, Universitat Pompeii Fabra in Barcelona, Spain. He serves as the president of both the Society of Judgment and Decision-Making and the European Association for Decision-Making. He's written several books around learning, judgment, and decision-making. His most recent work is the New York Times bestseller, The Myth of Experience, Why We Learn the Wrong Lessons and Ways to Correct Them. Robin, welcome to the Science of Success. Hi, thank you. Well, it's it's an honor to have you on the show. I've been a fan of your work for a long, long time, and uh, it, you know, decision making is a topic that's very near and dear to my heart. And and all of the work that you've done around decision making has been really transformational to to the field. And so, you know, thank you for that, and thank you for for coming on. Well, thank you for having me on here. You have some wonderful podcasts already, so I hope I can keep it up. Excellent. Well, I'd love to jump right into to the meat of things and and talk about one of the themes that. From your work, I found to be tremendously both impactful and also really not only misunderstood, but just not understood at all by most people, which is the concept of wicked versus kind domains and, and how that impacts our behavior. I'd love with a start with maybe a high level perspective on that and, and then dig into the weeds a little bit. The idea came from work done over 40 years ago by Hedy Einhorn and myself. We wrote a paper in which we tried to understand. Why are people confident when their judgments are very bad? We use some mathematical models, but we tried to sort of look and see what, what, what was it, what, what, what caused this. And one of the things we conclusion came to was that it was feedback. The way feedback arrived depended on the structure of the environment. And therefore, we had to understand the role of feedback. That model just basically said, look, there are situations in which people will make bad decisions because the feedback they're getting is, is, is inadequate. I started thinking about this. Uh, probably took me a long time because I didn't really write about it, about it until 19, 2001, about 25 years later on. And there the idea was that I was trying to understand intuition. Under what conditions is an intuition good and what conditions is an intuition bad? Well, the first thing about intuition you realize is that intuitions are mainly learned experiences. They're the reactions which you've learned from your, from, from your experience. And therefore, if you want to figure out what, when an intuition is going to be bad, then figure out what was the environment in which it was acquired. What was the characteristic environment in which it was acquired? If it was going to be good, what was the environment in which it was acquired? And this came to the notion that you can characterize the environment in which you learn things on a range from wicked, which is very difficult, very, very, very hard to learn, it, to kind. That was the origin of all that. And so it's such a profound insight, this idea that the environment and the structure of the environment that you're in has a very important relationship to the feedback you receive, which then impacts your own decision calculus. Give me a couple examples of of what you would consider 
the kinder domains and what you would consider the more wicked domains? Well, an example of a kind environment would be learning to play tennis. When you're playing, learning to play tennis, basically everything you do, you get immediate feedback from. If you hit the ball, it goes into the net. If you hit the ball, it doesn't go into the net. It, it goes out, it goes out, it goes in, comes back, and so on and so forth. You get a complete immediate feedback on what's going on. So that's, that's what I would call a kind environment, where basically you're getting quick, very good feedback. A wicked environment is an environment where the feedback is long, delayed, missing, or perhaps even wrong. A classic example of that is uh, emergency rooms in hospitals. The emergency room physician usually has a very short time in which to make a decision. A patient comes in and has to be sent somewhere else. But what happens in most hospitals is that they, the physicians don't actually get to see what happened to the patients. So the feedback is, is long, delayed, and could even be inaccurate. Yeah, that makes total sense. And I'm sure you would characterize something like chess as another skill set that has very tight feedback loops, very defined and clear parameters, where it's essentially a very kind learning environment. Yes, chess would be a kind learning environment. The kind doesn't mean that you're going to be the best chess player, but it means that it characterizes the environment. Tennis is also a good example, because you can also imagine a tennis played on the planet Mars, where the rules are different, where the biology the geography works differently, in which case you would use the same rules in, in Mars, you would get problems. Yeah, that makes total sense. And dig into that a little more, the analogy that you previously used in a lot of your work around this concept of, in many wicked domains, it's as if we're playing Martian tennis. Yes, exactly, exactly. There's an interesting example of why this is so important. There's a wonderful um, Devin Sandler had this fantastic bicycle he once made. He used to call it a backwards brain bicycle. He took a bicycle and he inverted the, the way the wheels worked. I.e., instead of when you turn left, you went right. When you went right, you turned left. So it was inverted. And he gave this bicycle to people and asked them to learn to ride it. And people had a very great difficulty in learning to ride it. They couldn't. Because basically they couldn't overcome this, this feedback. He'd made it wicked for them, and they couldn't do it. So then he also tried it himself, and he worked 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 and he worked, and eventually he learned to ride the bicycle backwards. But he couldn't ride the bicycle normally anymore. It's very fascinating. It's such an important thing to really think about, this notion that a lot of fields, and really most fields, in my opinion, that we really work in, whether it's things like business, things like investing, as you said, emergency rooms, healthcare, most of the, the things we interact with in our daily lives, if we're not professional tennis players or people that are focused on maybe even something like poker, which is probably more on the kind side, though has a few elements of wickedness. Most of the world, the feedback loops are long, they're murky, they could be wrong. I guess the first question would be, why do we fall prey to thinking that our feedback is good when it's often not? Well, I, I think a lot of the things you do every day, you get good feedback from. For example, walking through a room, you get feedback from objects, you hit them. Think of driving a car. You're getting feedback constantly when you get driving a car. You can make immediate adjustments. And so I think a lot of, the physical, a lot of our physical activities get very good, quick feedback. And this get, seems to get translated to our minds. Uh, because frequently in our minds, we do, we, we're not actually making exact judgments. We're just living and getting through through the moment. And with that, the, the rough feedback it, it doesn't treat us, teach us what, what, what's going wrong. That makes total sense. And when we're one of the most dangerous parts about being in a wicked environment is that we often don't know that we're in one. Exactly. How do we start to recognize when we are in wicked environments and what happens when we don't? Well, I think there's no substitute for hard work. People have to think about the environment they're in, ask themselves what feedback they're getting. Are there any other things that are in the way? Is the feedback accurate? Are they able to adjust to it? And so on and so forth. So I think in some sense, what one has to do is essentially become like an intuitive scientist. In the book I wrote with Emery Sawyer, we talk about intuitive scientists, intuitive skeptical scientists, people who who basically, when they see an outcome, don't immediately accept what it is, but question it and actually come up with other ideas about it. A lot of the time, and this is the biggest problem of all, is, is to get a self-awareness of when the environment might be bad. I'm not saying that's easy to do. No, that makes sense. And I want to come back to the self-awareness piece and how we can cultivate that better. But tell me a little bit more before we do that about this concept of 
the intuitive scientist or the intuitive skeptic? How do you start to train those muscles? And what does that look like to you? Well, the notion that we came up with is the following. The way we are trained to think or learn to think is immediately to come up with a conclusion and run with the conclusion. And it's very quick. We don't have a, an instinct to stop, look for certain evidence, or, or, or search for other hypotheses. So basically, we're a bit too believing. We're not skeptical enough. So the, the point we're, we make in the book is that you, you have to adopt a skeptical attitude towards your inferential life. And if you're good at that, eventually you can, you can become a scientist who, who actually generates alternative hypotheses and, and is able to find ways of testing them. In essence, it's very important to, instead of jumping to conclusions quickly or just immediately leaning in on the first thing we think about, really spend some time stepping back, looking for both sides, looking for disconfirming evidence and things that may overturn a conclusion before you really lock in on it and, and start to believe that it's true. I think we're all a little bit lazy in the sense that we want to go with the first idea we come up with. But very often, the first idea we come up with is only a start, and, and you need to go to two or three or four more ideas before you come up with something that's better. What happens when we don't have the right feedback mechanisms, and, and whether it's emergency rooms or other examples, give me a sense of some of the consequences if we don't take this idea really seriously and start to understand when we are treading in a more wicked domain. Basically, if you don't take control over, over the situation you're in, your decisions become essentially random. Basically, you're no longer in control of what's going on, and the outcome is random. Do you want to live in a world like that, where basically the world's under, under control of something else outside of your control? So I think the issue of control is very important. Tell me a little bit more about that. Well, are you in control of your decisions? Or are your decisions just a function of the environment you happen to meet? I'll give you an example. Think of somebody who is brought up in the United States. Compare that with somebody who's brought up in the UK. And ask them which sports they like. And the American's going to say baseball, say, and the Englishman's going to say cricket. Now, there's no right answer. But why do they say that? It's because of what they've been exposed to. They didn't have a choice right at the beginning of their lives to say, are you going to prefer cricket or baseball? But basically, they, they grew up in, in environments where basically they had cricket and baseball, respectively. So uh, what I mean by control is, are you in fact in control of the decision you've taken? Or is it your decision actually made for you by the environment? Yeah, that makes total sense. And that's a great analogy. You could say the same thing about American football or European football, or as we would call it, soccer. That framework really applies much more broadly to, in most cases, if we really take a hard look at ourselves, our ideological principles, our political beliefs, our religious affiliations. I mean, all of those things are essentially programmed into us by our environment with very little conscious decision-making or control on our part. By our experiences, yeah. Our tastes are formed by our experiences. And so we have to be aware of that. In baseball and, and cricket, it may not be very important, but for other things, it could be quite important. Absolutely. And the more we tread into some wicked domains, the more important it gets to really understand where our footing is. One of the things that I've always really struggled with or thought about or a fundamental question that I played with in my mind for a long time is this notion of how do we apply the principles, the concept of deliberate practice, which I'm sure you're familiar with, in really wicked fields where there aren't great feedback loops, how, you know, things like business or management or, or investing, how do we start to think about applying some of the tools or principles of deliberate practice? How do we level up our own decision making in those areas where we don't have access to quality feedback? Well, if we don't have access to quality feedback, one idea is to see what you can do to, 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 get, to get substitute feedback. Can you get a better causal idea of what's going on? Can you be more accurate in thinking about how much randomness is affecting your decisions? I think humans have a great difficulty in estimating how much the decisions are actually outcomes depend on just on chance. And so I think being able to ask yourself the question, am I in a, situ in a kind of situation where the outcomes are determined by chance or do I have more control over them? 
Dance with Chance, which was one of your work that you had many years ago, is one of the early books I read when I was in, I think, college around this idea of probabilistic thinking and 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 how to understand that. But the notion that you just touched on, which is another principle that is is often misunderstood, is really how much random randomness truly governs huge swaths of our lives, despite the fact that we often think things are under our control. Yeah. Take the, the famous regression towards the mean. The story of Sports Illustrated. And the Sports Illustrated story is that people who get on the cover of Sports Illustrated are doomed somewhat. They, they don't do so well after it. But in fact, what's happened is the people who go on the covers have been selected when they were at the peak of their, of their, of their lifetime performances. And therefore, it's not surprising that they didn't do, they didn't do quite as well the second time around. But people want to attribute causal reasons all the time, where in fact it may not be causal reasons that, 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 that drive the situation, but just random events. And, and we, we have great difficulty in accepting random events. Earlier we talked a little bit about poker, poker players. One of the things that people may, may learn from poker is to appreciate better the effects chance can have on, on outcomes. The problem is, though, in, in most of the real world decisions, the world is not as, as neatly defined as it is in poker. Sadly. <laughs> and therefore, uh, it's harder to, to understand exactly how much randomness has played a role. Yeah. They're one of the most helpful mental models that has helped me conceptualize that more effectively is looking at any outcome essentially as two dice rolls, one on the chance dice and one on the skill dice. Right. And, and in different activities, maybe one of those dice is more weighted or has more numbers or whatever. But, you know, in chess, the chance dice is almost nothing. And the skill dice is the only dice that matters. In poker, maybe the chance dice is, is 70% of the outcome or whatever. But that idea that really in most things in life, there's a component of randomness and there's a component of skill or ability or causation. And trying to blend those two things into your understanding can be a really impactful way to conceptualize that. And I think people want to, to launch skill. They want to reward people based on skill. But another sport which has a big chance element in it is golf. We tend to think of golf as being a skill game. It is a skill game. But over four rounds of golf, and two tournaments are decided by one or two shots. One or two shots going in the hole are quite a, it's quite a random event. And people may lose a tournament but because somebody else got a hole in one or a hole in two just by sheer chance. The way it's written up, it's not written up as though it was by chance. That's right. And a corollary of that is this notion that if you have two people whose skill is identical, whether it's on the low end, the high end, then really the, the determining factor at that point is largely chance. Exactly. Exactly. Which is another thing that is both non-intuitive and hard to grasp if you haven't. Well, it's hard to grasp and it's hard to sort of um, to rationalize to oneself. These outcomes are being determined by chance. And for example, we just finished the weekend, I was just watching, watching this PGA Golf Championship won by Phil Mickelson. And a lot is made up about him being 50 years old, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But at the same time, he didn't win very much. And yet there were also shots of his that went into the hole from, from the bunker. And that, being able to do that again it would be almost impossible. Yeah, that's a really good way to characterize that. So coming back to something I asked a minute ago, this idea of in fields with murky or disjointed feedback loops, one of the concepts you recommended to improve our ability to learn from our experiences was to find substitute feedback or feedback that imitates or, or gets us some more information about decision quality. Tell me a little bit more about that idea and, and how we might be able to do that. So you're, you're asking about decision quality. Well, there's nothing you can do except be a bit old-fashioned and look at the way you're making the decision, breaking it down into parts, keeping your emotions under control, and a list of things like that. I don't have a formula. I can just suggest you follow a procedure. That makes sense. And, and this notion of breaking our decision-making down, trying to analyze it, trying to pull emotion out of it. Really, one a, a tool that I'm a big fan of is, is using something like a decision journal to map out ahead of time. I think X is going to happen. Here's why. Here's what I think the risks are. And here's my emotional state and so forth. And then revisiting that with some 
frequency in the future to see really how the decision played out and yeah. what you foresaw, what you didn't, and, and try to ascertain why. One can do a kind of a decision audit, which is useful. Another thing I think is very important to think about is whether you can actually, when you're making a decision, think about what would have to happen if, if you were to be successful, what would have to happen if you, do, if you failed. And one way of doing this is perhaps is to use a little bit of what I call future perfect thinking. And that is to ask yourself, say that, imagine that the decision has been taken, the outcomes occurred, and it's, you're already five years in, in the future. And imagine that the, the outcome was good. Explain how, how the outcome was good, why the outcome was good. Then another, another scenario, do the same thing again, but this time the, the outcome was bad. Explain why the outcome was bad. And use hindsight to explain why the outcome was bad in, in a future perfect sense, and so on and so forth. And if you, you, go, you do this kind of thing, I think you get a lot of insight into what can go right, what can go wrong. I love that example. And using tools of thought like that are very powerful ways. To- yeah. I call it the, the future perfect method. The future perfect method. I like yeah. That. Other people have, uh, Gary Klein, I think, came up with what he called the pre mortem. Yep, that's right. Very similar. Which is very, very, it's a very similar idea. Yep. And I think it's very powerful. So earlier you, you touched on this notion of how intuition is formed and how our experiences shape our intuition. Tell me a little bit more about what intuition is and why we often misunderstand or don't understand what really goes into the creation of it. Intuition is, roughly speaking, a sense of something about to happen or a prediction you're making where you're able to come up with an answer quickly and it seems to be correct to you. It's a sense of something happening. I'll give you an example of an intuition. A few years ago, I went out with my family and we came back late to the house. As we walked into the house, I noticed that all of a sudden that there were some lights on in the house which we normally never had on. And I suddenly had a thought, an intuition, that somebody had been in the house. And it turned out to be correct. There was, there was actually a burglar. But that was something, that was, that's an example of an intuition. Because basically, I didn't ask myself what was going on. I just saw the lights and thought, wow, there's somebody else in the house. And then we found, found the bird actually had been, but it was bad. But so that's an in, in, intuition, is a thought that comes up like that. Now, why, why did I have that thought? Well, I guess what happened was I was able to recognize very quickly that there's something different here. And because of that, I was able to come to a, to a, a, a conclusion. Now, that's, what, that's one kind of intuition. Other kinds of intuitions could be, could be, I had a colleague once who was interviewing a job candidate. And the job candidate was terrific. He had all kinds of fantastic records of things he'd done, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Except that when my colleague interviewed him, there was just something he couldn't quite understand. There was something, something missing. And he was aware that he couldn't put his finger on it. So he had a kind of intuition that this candidate had some problem. The question is, what do you do with that intuition? Well, what he did was actually very smart. He went to the, the meeting where they were going to discuss the candidates. And after everyone had talked about this candidate, how good he was, he said, well, I have this funny feeling about this person. And it turned out that other colleagues had the same funny feeling. And so they were able to have a deeper conversation about it, or perhaps it was the cause of the, of the funny feeling and, and whether the candidate was good or not. So I haven't given you a sharp definition of intuition because I don't think there's a sharp definition. But we, we recognize it as having come to a conclusion without very quickly and without having to think very hard. That's a great way to phrase it. Usually we have a lot of confidence in it. That brings me to the other side of the coin in, in some sense of intuition, but also more broadly, how we can, we can learn the wrong things from our experiences. Tell me a little bit about the concept of the myth of experience. Well, the whole notion is we are built to learn from experience. From early childhood, we learn from experience. We observe, we experience, we learn. And so if we're living in, a, in an environment in which we are getting good feedback in a kind environment, basically we're going to learn. But the problem is that the environments in which we are in may not be kind to us. There may, may, may be false information. There may, may be missing information. There may be irrelevant information. And if we are, don't take account of those, those, those missing and irrelevant information, we will make mistakes. Tell me a little bit more about some of the ways that our experience can mislead us. 
Well, experience can mislead us if it takes us down the wrong, the wrong track. If we wanted to choose, say we want to choose between two alternatives, and the data we got from our experience gives us the wrong choice. I'm not explaining that very well. I'm sorry. That's a good way to look at it. And some of the broader themes from, from myth of experience around whether experience can limit our creative potential or conceal dangerous outcomes or, or danger in the environment, whether it, it narrows our focus, our options away from things that maybe we should be focused on. There's some really interesting insights that you've shared in your work around the ways that experience can often, while in many cases it's extremely beneficial, can sometimes mislead us into risky or, or, or dangerous situations. Well, for example, one of our problems with experience is how do we handle disasters? Disasters, are, we experience disasters, we learn from the disasters, we experience them, but we don't necessarily think they're fully in entire afterwards. Consider disasters like Katrina. Katrina was a horrible disaster in New Orleans. But a year before, two years before, there was another hurricane that came in and had similar characteristics. And people just extrapolated what they'd learned from the other hurricane to what was going to happen this time, and they were wrong. So basically, experience can't handle changes. That's a really good way to succinctly describe that concept. The environment changes in some way. The experience is not going to help us. I really like that characterization. And as we touched on earlier in a lot of these wicked domains, we often don't know the situation has changed. Exactly. And even coronavirus is, is a great example of, I mean, we've had you know, swine flu, bird flu, SARS, all of these very characteristically similar outbreaks that had a massively different impact. We didn't know in advance that this was going to be such a different situation. And we were, as a planet, really poorly equipped to respond to it. I think that the current pandemic is really an interesting example of some of the things that we talked about in our book. Because basically, here is something that doesn't quite res resembles a, a bit some of these other things that like you just said, but is actually quite different. The numbers take off exponentially, which goes beyond our experience. And the data comes in, the feedback we get is very strange because we get feedback about, on different time series. And all of this is all very difficult to put together as, as a regular citizen, it's also very difficult to put together as a scientist. Yeah, it's, it's a great case study, actually. And a lot of the themes we've talked about in terms of how Certainly a wicked domain where the feedback loops are long, different timelines. You're not sure what variables matter, which variables don't, and the consequences are massively high stakes in terms of whether you get it right or not. And certain things have gone well, but many, many things haven't gone well. And that's a lot of those things are as a result of that whole situation being such a wicked learning environment. Yeah, I, I think the pandemic is a real learning environment. That's true. I wonder what the world will do now, whether we will learn from it. Hopefully. Or what we'll learn. That's right. That notion that you touched on a minute ago is another very interesting concept, which is this idea that in some instances, perhaps the moment of greatest danger could be when things are similar, but not the same, and we don't see the difference. There's another problem, which is the difference between prevention of a disaster and the cure for a disaster. We value them differently. For example, if someone comes up with a cure for COVID-19, they're considered to be a hero. If someone actually prevents COVID-19 happening, they're rewarded, but at a much lower level. And somehow or other, basically, we love the person who, who found the cure. We don't give the same reward to the person who prevented this, the disaster happening. How we set up systems to prevent things is actually very difficult. Because experience of prevention may actually make prevention to seem less important. That's such a fascinating perspective that is really insightful. And whether you're looking at it from the perspective of business management or even just our broader social structures, how do we effectively incentivize prevention over cures, for lack of a better term, because you're right. I mean, resolving the pandemic, you're a hero. But if you stop something that could have been bad, but didn't happen, you get a slap on the back and a great job. And 10 minutes later, it's forgotten about. Yeah. And I suspect that goes on, for example, in, in the economy, when people do things just to save the economy or don't do things that they could have saved the economy. Explain that a little bit more. Well, we just said that the, the, the person who prevents a, a pandemic doesn't get as much recognition as the person who's, who was cured pandemic. 
Well, the same thing could happen in the economy. When the economy is going along, and if something is done, you save the economy. On the other hand, in other situations, maybe you want, you want to just do something different, which prevents something happening. And people can't see the prevention, the outcome of the prevention. So actually, the prevention cure problem is quite general and difficult to handle. What are your thoughts around how to more effectively structure organizations or incentives to help mitigate that? I think, first of all, there has to be more explicit recognition of the principle of prevention versus cure. Secondly, I think you you should reward people who actually are involved in preventions by giving awards, by financially rewarding them, and ensuring what, what occurred. There are some industries which are very good at doing this, like travel industries, where basically you don't want the airplanes falling out of the sky. You don't want to just repair them. You can't repair them afterwards. So basically, what incentives can you put in so that the prevention people can get rewarded? That's a great example and showcases a really important framework that has worked extremely well over the last hundred years as aviation safety has improved. That's a very prevention-oriented culture, for lack of a better term, yeah. Yeah. that I'm sure a lot of lessons could be pulled from. I'm curious, for someone who's listened to our conversation and wants to start to implement some of these themes or ideas into their lives, whether it's on the prevention cure problem, whether it's learning environments, decision-making, et cetera, what would be one action item that you would give them to start to take concrete steps towards putting these ideas into practice? I think one of the things is important is people be able to recognize the situations they're in. And one of the things one could do is give people some vignettes of types of situations. For example, a regression towards the mean vignette. Learn the characteristics of, of, of the Sports Illustrated example we discussed earlier. And ask yourself, is this like a Sports Illustrated situation? Another one I, I like is the meteorologist. Although people have, have been shown to have bad or inaccurate judgments, it turns out the meteorologists have turned out to be pretty good. They predict the weather quite well, and, and quite often they're well calibrated, probabilistically speaking. And you should ask yourself the question, why are meteorologists good when other people aren't so good? Uh, and usually the answers are, well, they get feedback every day, good, that's great. They have good causal models of, of the situation, that's great. But what people don't remember is that a very key aspect of, of the meteorologist's job is the meteorologist makes a prediction, but the prediction doesn't affect the weather. That's interesting. In lots of other situations, your prediction will actually also affect what happens. So basically, one of the things you can do is develop a vignette of meteorology and say, is this situation like meteorology? I, are we in a situation where there is a chance of your prediction affecting the outcome? So what I would re- recommend is developing four or five of these kinds of vignettes of, of classes and situations, and then always be asking yourself the question, am I in a situation which is like this or like that? That's a great piece of advice. And you've probably come across this term in some form or fashion, but I love to characterize those, as you call them, vignettes, as mental models is another term of art that, that you'll often hear similarly describing those frameworks, right? Regression to the mean and so forth. And so really familiarizing yourself with a couple important and powerful mental models can really transform the way you approach the world. I think for most people, actually, having a simple model, a simple example of a kind of model is useful because it's easy to remember. It's like having a little, a little scenario, a little story. And if, if you can have, keep, have, have a series of stories, then I think you can go a long way analytically. And for people who want to find more about you and your work online, what's the best place for them to find those things? Well, go to my uh, webpage, which is www.rmhogarth.com. If they want to write to me, write my email, robin.hogarth at upf.edu. Those would be the two places to go to. Well, Robin, thank you so much for coming on the show, for all of your decades of fascinating work and research in the, in the field of decision-making and for sharing all of these insights and all this wisdom with our listeners. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for listening to The Science of Success. We created the show to help you, our listeners, master evidence-based growth. I love hearing from listeners. If you want to reach out, share your story, or just say hi, shoot me an email. My email is matt 
at successpodcast.com. That's M-A-T-T at successpodcast.com. I'd love to hear from you, and I read and respond to every single listener email. I'm going to give you three reasons why you should sign up for our email list today by going to successpodcast.com, signing up right on the homepage. There's some incredible stuff that's only available to those on the email list, so be sure to sign up, including an exclusive curated weekly email from us called Mindset Monday, which is short, simple, filled with articles, stories, things that we found interesting and fascinating in the world of evidence-based growth in the last week. Next, you're getting an exclusive chance to shape the show, including voting on guests, submitting your own personal questions that we'll ask guests on air, and much more. Lastly, you're going to get a free guide we created based on listener demand, our most popular guide, which is called How to Organize and Remember Everything. You can get it completely for free, along with another surprise bonus guide by signing up and joining the email list today. Again, you can do that at successpodcast.com, sign up right at the homepage, or If you're on the go, just text the word SMARTER, S-M-A-R-T-E-R, to the number 44222. Remember, the greatest compliment you can give us is a referral to a friend, either live or online. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave us an awesome review and subscribe on iTunes because that helps boost the algorithm that helps us move up the iTunes rankings and helps more people discover the science of success. Don't forget, if you want to get all the incredible information we talk about in the show, links, transcripts, everything we discuss, and much more, be sure to check out our show notes. You can get those at successpodcast.com. Just hit the show notes button right at the top. Thanks again, and we'll see you on the next episode of The Science of Success. 